I've been keeping isopods in bins for years. No, not those giant deep sea things. I'm talking about the ones you'd find in your backyard under a log. What are commonly referred to as roly polies, pill bugs, potato bugs, sow bugs, wood louse, cheese bobs, slaters, you get the idea. There are about as many different names for them as there are known species. Upwards of 5,000 of those inhabit land alone, ranging in size, shape, color, and more. The diversity truly is astounding. There are even isopods that literally look like a rubber ducky. No, I'm not joking. You can't tell me that doesn't look like a ducky. Keeping isopods as pets is pretty easy and accessible because you really only need a properly designed bin to house them in. It works well and is cheap to do, which is why most people have multiple setups. That said, I feel like I can't truly appreciate them in these bins. That's why I decided to make a dedicated area for them and other invertebrates in the animal room. More on that in a future video, but I think the best place to begin is with none other than the rubber ducky isopods. To keep everything standard, I'll work with these rimless aquariums. That said, modification is required because I have specific goals in mind. That's why I cut through the silicone to remove this panel of glass and scraped off the existing bead. I measured the space between to cut down a different piece of glass that fits perfectly in the void. I then took this down to three separate pieces, which I sanded to remove sharp edges and labeled for easy assembly. Everything needs re-siliconed, which is why I added tape. This made it easy to neatly create new beads. I just evened it out after application, removed the tape, and allowed it to cure. Continuing upward, I taped cardboard along the substrate tray to create a small separation between it and the door, which I dry fit with tape. I attached the top piece above this and allowed the silicone to cure. After removing the tape, I accounted for a pump that would create a dripping feature. I measured and cut down glass accordingly. It also needed a lid, which is what I have this glass for, but I had to create an opening for the pieces I just made. To do that, I marked the corner, used a guide to drill a hole, scored along the other edges, and created separations with a tool. I attempted to do something similar for ventilation, but it caused the glass to crack. I instead cut it into separate pieces and attached them along the top independently. I also secured the ones I cut for the pump within the back opening, as well as a screen on the top. Once the silicone cured, I attached a self-leveling mat to the bottom and removed the anchoring tape. To get the door to work, I'll use square dowels. I cut them down into a few lengths and drilled holes in the end. These will accommodate bamboo skewer tips and small neodymium magnets. I attached the skewers with CA glue and the magnets with a quick cure epoxy. I figured that painting it black would also make for a cleaner look. After that dried, I applied black silicone and stuck them to the glass. As stated, I want full access to the pump from the outside, and this push connect bulkhead will make that possible. I put vinyl tubes and a push connect hookup on the pump, which allowed me to add a quarter inch line and an elbow making hookup to the bulkhead easy. I put more tubing and a valve on the opposite side, along with a cap on the end. I also drilled holes along the line before all of that to create a dripping feature. That said, it was too strong initially, so I adjusted things until it looked like this. The rubber duckies originate from limestone caves in Thailand, so that was largely my inspiration for this project. Selecting the right materials to pull that off was imperative, and this elephant skin stone, which is a type of limestone, seemed like a great option. They are heavy though, so I had to put XPS foam in the tank to distribute their weight evenly. I experimented with a few layouts, and this is usually the part that takes long, but in no time a promising configuration arose. That said, I wanted the front half of the cave to be wet and the back to be dry. That's where the tubing from earlier came into play. I absolutely loved the look. I didn't want anything crazy here, just a gentle trickle of water over the front of the stones. That and moss on the top. Normally I wouldn't add it this early in the process, but I had to finalize the proof of concept. Additionally, I wanted to ensure the structure would remain together. I mixed up epoxy which I used to bond the stones together from the back. Once secured, I removed excess foam from the bottom. Embellishing the main structure with other stones solidified the cave's appearance. And even though it was challenging to work in such a small space, I was able to pull it off without any further adhesives. Here you can also get a better look at what I was talking about earlier. The back is completely dry. That said, there were gaps along the bottom. 
I filled those and others with filter sponge, which will protect the pump from intaking debris. I sprinkled limestone gravel over this to create a buffer between the water and the substrate. I also rehydrated sphagnum moss. This made it easy to fill cracks and will ensure the substrate stays put. As for the front, I filled it in with sponge, gravel, and limestone sand. To encourage a fresh and healthy environment, I sprinkled a thin layer of charcoal throughout. That meant I could finally add this substrate. This is a blend that I formulated specifically for these isopods. It's composed of what I would typically use, but it also features limestone powder, dietary limestone, and a potting soil containing bat guano. That might sound weird, but remember, they originate from limestone caves. Anyway, I piled up the substrate in a way that appeared seamless around the rock work. One of the elements I was most excited about were these roots. I found them unearthed in my yard after the pond excavation, so naturally I set them aside for a future build. I boiled and rinsed them before use. Weaving these along the rockwork truly naturalized the appearance. It's what I imagined from the start, and not only am I glad that I collected these roots, but that I also decided to use them for this specific project. I nested java moss and stones within them for more texture. I placed more elements along the top as well to hide the filter compartment. I wanted the cave to appear as though it was embedded into a hillside. Adding more substrate not only achieved this look, but hid the tubing as well. A few more stones and roots stabilized this area and really added to the aesthetic. That more or less completed the hardscape layout. Although it looked great, the details would make it shine. This Cryptanthus nubicola seemed like an obvious choice, while Hemigraphus raponda added more texture. A tuft of Selaginella uncinata atop the cave looked great as well. No isopod setup would be complete without leaf litter either. I had a random assortment of larger leaves that I broke up and scattered throughout. From a scale perspective, these looked off. Luckily I was able to find smaller ones outside that when sprinkled on top looked incredible. A few alder cones and choice locations tied into this as well. Anubius nana petite, thread moss, a quick mist, and ficus pumula quercifolia finished things off. The last thing I had to do with the enclosure was attach the door. If you recall, I intended to use the skewers from earlier. That didn't work right, so I instead stuck another board on the left that I could install hinges on. I put a knob on the right side as well. Thanks to the magnets, the door remains closed when shut without any locking hardware. And although isopods typically are the cleanup crew, we might as well give the duckies one of their own in the form of pink springtails. I personally thought these would be a great addition over the ones I'd typically use. The only thing left to do was round up a few of the pods and set them free into their new home. Now this was a sight to see. I've been keeping rubber ducky isopods since 2019 and have never witnessed behavior like this. They are shy animals and typically hide under the leaves immediately after being introduced to a bin. As you can see, that wasn't the case here. The pods were exploring nearly every aspect of their home, both high and low. It was also incredible to see them explore the cave. Obviously it was something I wanted to see, but I wasn't sure if they would do it this early on. This also has me curious how they'll use it and the rest of their setup moving forward. Because even though they were active initially, I don't anticipate I'll see them often unless it's feeding time. They usually spend most of their time slightly underground. Then again, my frame of reference is only from keeping them in a bin. Observation would inevitably begin with disturbance, so maybe things will be different in something like this. I'd assume a proper day and night cycle would make a difference as well. Regardless, I'm extremely pleased with how this turned out. Despite being small, it has a lot of great features. A forest floor, nice detail on the rock work, a dry high ground, and a mini dripping limestone cave. When combined together, these all make for an incredibly cohesive piece, perfect for showcasing the rubber ducky isopod. 
The bins have been great for years. They're fairly easy to do and inexpensive. If something like that is more your speed, I'll leave a link to how I built mine in the description. That said, it's probably easier to create the necessary microclimates for success in something like this as opposed to a bin. Anyway, I'll probably keep most of mine going alongside displays, but all of this has me excited to keep other species in setups like this. In a way, it feels like a completely new chapter.